I'm David L. Goodwin, a trustee of the Historical Society of the New York Courts. And this interview is part of the Society's ongoing recording of the Bar's response to the pandemic project. Uh, as everyone knows who's you know, thinking about this right now, the COVID-19 pandemic has, to put it mildly, um, upended everything across the country and across the state. Um, but it's had a particular and outsized impact on the practice of law. And the project, uh, which again is ongoing, aims to record history as it happens by chronicling how the pandemic has affected the practice of law throughout New York State. And to that end, we're conducting individual interviews highlighting the personal accounts of New York attorneys during this period of virtual court proceedings and virtual everything else. Um, my interviewee today is Andrew Gerst, a lawyer at Mobilization for Justice. And rather than uh, do a belabored introduction, um, Andrew, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you work, and what Mobilization for Justice does? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, David, so much. It's great to be here. I think this is an incredible project, and it's very important to document everything that's been going on for the last few months. Um, so I work at a nonprofit organization called Mobilization for Justice. We work with low-income families across all five boroughs. Um, I work in the Children's Rights Unit, um, which means I focus most of my practice on special education law. We also do some school discipline cases. Um, our office is in Lower Manhattan. The organization also has uh, another office in the Bronx. It focuses on housing. Um, so in addition to the special education and school disciplinary um, projects, what other things does Mobilization for Justice do outside of your particular unit? Sure, yeah. So there are all kinds of attorneys, social workers, paralegals, and support staff who work on many, many different things. Um, housing, we have a government benefits project that focuses on social security, SSI, disability. We have an immigration unit. We have a foreclosure unit that works with homeowners. Um, and we have a kinship care lawgiver project for non-custodial parents with family issues uh, and several other units as well. So it's fair to say that uh, Mobilization for Justice attorneys do a lot of work directly with clients and directly with a lot of the uh, folks that are trying to help out. Yes, absolutely. We are the in the trenches legal services organization. So. so taking a step outside of the office for a second, um, can you briefly speak about how you and your family have been affected by COVID-19 just as a personal matter? Yeah, um, it's, it's been challenging. I'm not going to lie. It's been very much up and down. Um, my wife and I decided to stay in New York City during the pandemic. Uh, uh, April was one of the hardest months I've ever experienced. Uh, we heard the sirens 24 hours a day. Every time we left our apartment in Harlem, we would see one or two ambulances outside. Uh, and you know, even now we see people with candles outside all the time and, and there are wakes happening and, and there's just been so much suffering all around us. Uh, we've really tried to be tough and, and grow stronger through it, but it has been very challenging. Are you glad you stayed? Given as I know a lot of people did end up uh, taking leave of the city during the worst periods of the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think we are glad we stayed. You know, uh, Tara, my wife and I are both really committed to working with underserved communities and, and fighting for the people, uh, you know, that we live with. And we didn't want to abandon our clients, you know, when, when we, they may need our help the most. So we are glad we stayed. So with that said, I'd like to take a step back into the office. And before I ask you about how your legal practice has been affected by COVID, as a, you know, former special ed practitioner myself, um, I know that it can be a little bit unusual from the perspective of day-to-day uh, you know, -day legal practice. So before we go into how it's been affected, can you briefly describe what special education practice looks like um, on a normal basis before we get into the departure? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we work with families of students who have an identified disability under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, and what this normally means is a parent will come to us when their child is struggling in school. Uh, this could be an academic issue where they're not learning, or it could be a social issue. They might be experiencing bullying, something like that. And they've, at this point, they've probably already reached out to the school a few times. They haven't gotten a satisfactory response and they need help. Um, so what we do is we help the parents usually with filing a due process complaint, um, asserting that their child has been denied uh, the term of art is a free and appropriate public education. 
um, and we seek compensatory services. So this could be tutoring, this could be occupational therapy, speech therapy, whatever that the child needs to make, make appropriate progress. Um, and so we do a lot of practice in administrative hearings before administrative law judges, also known as impartial hearing officers. We also will represent families at IEP meetings, which are less formal, um, and at suspension hearings as well, um, which happen you know, under normal times. Uh, there's a whole separate procedure within the DOE, although during COVID, there have been very few suspensions. So, I mean, your practice then is very hooked into the educational system, the school system in New York City, working in a particular way, right? Yes. Yeah. And what do these impartial hearings actually look like? So outside of the pandemic, if you're going through a court proceeding, what happens in that court proceeding? So it is somewhat informal in the sense that there's, there's no courtroom per se. It's more like an office. Uh, you go to 131 Livingston Street in downtown Brooklyn. You wait in what feels like a, a cafeteria, which actually was a cafeteria for a long time. Um, now it feels more like an airport waiting room. Um, you get called. Uh, and you go sit at a, you know, like a large table in like a conference room. Um, there's an, an impartial hearing officer who's normally like a solo practitioner attorney who's decided to take on these cases as well, um, will preside. There'll be a court reporter with a laptop at one end. Uh, the parent will be present with or without an attorney. And the Department of Education will also have a representative. Um, and, you know, the hearing officer will... Uh, start off the hearing by just explaining the proceedings. They may take some evidence. They will swear in the witnesses. There may be some brief direct testimony, some brief cross-examination from witnesses, uh, opening and closing statements. And then the hearing officer renders a decision usually in a month or two. So an administrative bench trial, essentially. Exactly, yes, that's right. So with that baseline having been set, how has COVID changed all of that? Well. I think I, I may have mentioned earlier that we might be the only practice that has become more busy during COVID-19. Uh, what's been interesting um, is the hearings have all been proceeding as usual, but they've taken place over, over the phone. Um, and this has actually been very advantageous in the sense that while we previously had to wait for a hearing room at 131 Livingston Street, now we don't. And hearing officers would arrive late and we would wait for hours. Now we don't have those issues. Um, so all of our hearings are starting and ending when they're supposed to, um, and that's been really good. A lot of schools have also been scheduling IEP meetings. Um, so time that may have previously been spent on administrative tasks, we're dealing with classroom management, building maintenance, things like that, can now be spent on, on you know, IEP meetings and things like that. Um, I would say a lot of our legal work has shifted more to social work. So we've checked in with families to make sure that they are receiving the iPad that the city is supposed to be providing um, and that they are receiving their related services that they are legally required to obtain under the law. Just out of curiosity, um, I know that when I speak to the practitioners in the New York state courts, we do talk a little bit about how, for instance, the governor's suspension of deadlines affected their practice. Have there been any... Um, alterations to the requirements under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or any of the laws and regulations that take into account how COVID has changed the day-to-day -day operations of the schools? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so I believe the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, has proposed waiving the IDEA and essentially saying that schools are not responsible for providing a free and appropriate public education during the pandemic. Um, our community of special education advocates has opposed this um, as we don't think that our clients should be hurt any more than they already have been by the pandemic. Um, and so my understanding is for the time being, the IDEA is still fully intact, but that it could be waived at some point in the future. So you talk a little bit about how you've actually gotten more busy and how things are actually in a lot of ways um, running a little bit more efficiently. Could you offer some real life examples of uh, both the successes and the difficulties in your day-to-day -day role as an attorney during this period of mandated social distancing, institutional closures and other excitement? Sure, um, well, I'll start with, with the difficulties. So it, it's very hard to get certain types of records at the moment. Uh, so for example, some of the older special education documents are archived in a warehouse in Staten Island. 
Uh, I'm not making that up. And uh, we, you know, we sometimes we need those documents, but it's very hard to get them when no one is going to the warehouse at all. We have one case where we may need to get a subpoena. And even then, it's not clear that that's going to work. And the other major challenge is evaluations. Um, so we regularly have psychologists evaluate students, um, but it can be very hard to do that remotely, especially if a child has autism or another condition, which makes it hard for them to concentrate. Uh, the good news is we have still been winning a, a lot of cases. We've been able to proceed the same way as before, except over the phone. It's much more convenient for our clients. Uh, they don't need to come all the way from the Bronx to downtown Brooklyn. They can just call in on the phone. And many of the agencies that we work with are still able to do tutoring remotely, which is great. You just mentioned that the, um, some of the changes have made things more convenient for your clients. Um, can you talk about how sort of their experiences might be affected by this? What, what aspects of the changes you think are positive versus what aspects of the changes you think are negative for them? Sure. I think the, the most obvious positive is just is it's a less, less of a time sink. Uh, they don't have to travel back and forth. And, you know, a typical case might have a pre-hearing conference, a status conference, and a full hearing. And if the parent wanted to be involved with all three of those, they don't need to travel to Brooklyn all three times, which is great. Um, I'd say the main disadvantage is I certainly for pro se clients, I think the process over the phone might be a little harder than usual. There's a lot of people on the phone call usually. Um, so without an attorney, it may be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and, I, and I do think other than that though, things have really just gotten better with the phone hearings. I, I'm a big fan of them. So, I mean, taking this all into account then, are there particular core practices that you most miss? Um, things that you'd most like to see return and things that are better at, at this juncture consigned to the dustbin? Uh, I would say there's very few things that I would want to bring back. I, I think these changes have been good. Um, it's great that we don't have to print out hundreds and hundreds of pages of evidence, which I think was a large waste of paper and bad for the environment. We're able to just email everything. Um, I think that, you know, like I said, that the time that is saved is, is really great. Um, and the substance of the hearings is still pretty much the same. Um, one thing I would like to see happen is that I, I think notarization is, is a particular challenge right now. Um, I understand that e-notaries are allowed to do things, but it's still not that easy because it requires us FaceTiming with the client and the, the client has to physically mail the document to the notary uh, often. Um, so that's not great. Uh, the only other what thing I guess- not, Just to clarify, what kind of oh. documents do you often have to get notarized uh, in your practice? It's not that many, but the main one is the authorization to accept a settlement. Um, and then sometimes there are certain releases that a client needs to sign. Um, the only other thing that I would like to see returned is it's hard to have like a private conversation with a client when you're on the phone on a conference call. Um, but other than that, there's, there's really not a lot that I miss. You know, it's funny that you mentioned the um, electronic evidence. I know that uh, I practice mostly in the appellate division of the New York State Supreme Court. And during this period, we've been doing everything by email. Um, you know, we, we create briefs, but we file them by email. And there's this sort of standing threat that at the end of this process, we're going to have to go back to the office, print out everything we've been doing over the past God knows how many months and actually send it over. Um, we're very curious to see whether that actually happens. Um, do you think there's anything lost? And this might be a, a particular uh, issue not attendant to your area of practice. Do you think there's anything lost by not being in the place where the hearing is happening? Do you think there's any sort of gravitas missed by not being there in person with your adversary and everyone else? In my opinion, and let me emphasize, this is my personal opinion, not MFJs. I, I don't think there's anything lost. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of these hearings are very straightforward and parents have been waiting months and months, sometimes over a year for a hearing. Um, and the benefit of being able to start tutoring now or start other compensatory services now greatly outweighs any kind of sentimental or symbolic value of being there in person. So it sounds like the impartial hearings have really adapted. I mean, everything going to phone, everything going to email. What do you think the rest, well, the rest of, what do you think that the unified court system outside of the administrative context can learn from the particular experiences of the impartial hearing process as, uh, as they've adapted to the COVID situation? 
I mean, I think that the main lesson is that we, we should have done this five years ago. You know, there's, there's no reason not to, like you said, file motions by email uh, and, you know, cut down on paper and, and do things via Skype and Zoom. And, you know, I, I think maybe that should be the default going forward. And if a client uh, does have a compelling reason to require an in-person hearing, then they could file a motion requesting one. Um, but otherwise, I, I really feel like the rest of the world does things over email and, and lawyers seem to not want to do that for some reason. So I think we should get with the times and the unified court system should do that. Do you have any, um, based on your experiences, but also based on um, your, your practice more broadly, any words of advice for lawyers practicing um, in the court system at this time? Yeah. Um, well, I think the first thing I would say, be fearless. Uh, a lot of lawyers seem to be kind of wedded to the old way of doing things for no particular reason, as far as I can tell. Uh, I think people should not be afraid to tell people in power whether it's administrators or hearing officers or supervisors, that if something is antiquated, that it should be fixed. Um, I think the protests that we've seen during this COVID time have also emphasized there is a lot of clamor for change right now. And as lawyers and advocates, we should be at the front of that. Uh, I would say people should be reflective. I think it's, it's really important to look at our own practices and see what is and isn't working. Um, you know, for example, do I really need to file a 15 page due process complaint when a five page one is gonna have the same result and I might be able to help more clients. Um, and then most importantly, I think being kind right now is, is the most important thing. Um, there's so much stress and anxiety almost every day. There's something terrible happening really hint to COVID. Um, and even though we are lawyers, I think we have to remember that our clients are our people um, and they have families with a lot going on right now. Uh, uh, you know, personal story, I, I've had clients where a family member has, has passed away from COVID and they've just really had a tough time doing anything else other than dealing with that. And so it's important for us to become the social worker as much as we can and write those emails to schools and ask all the mundane questions um, and just go the extra mile for them even more than focusing on, on winning cases. Andrew, do you think there's anything we didn't touch upon that you'd, you'd like to share that you think is important to address? No, I, I think we've covered it. Uh, I'm very excited about this project. I hope that more lawyers and more courts embrace technology and, and not run away from it. And, and, you know, based on your comment about fearlessness, we'll have your uh, interview with Judge DeFiore set up immediately after. <laughs> let's, um, let's do it. Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, again, I know you don't practice in the unified court system per se, but I think the experience of administrative practitioners especially those who do provide such valuable direct services um, are, are equally valid and equally relevant and equally important as we move forward, because that's where justice is done throughout New York state. And um, your perspective is really, really invaluable. So thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's been yeah. great.